we go ahead and kick this off. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jennifer Lang, Director of Digital News and Audience Engagement at WFAE. And on behalf of all of us at WFAE, welcome to the Charlotte Podcast Festival pop-up. We've got a great lineup of speakers this week and I'm positive you'll learn a lot. Please ask questions. This festival is a place for you to learn. Put your questions in the Q&A in Zoom. You'll find that near the bottom of your screen. Um, in the chat, feel free to introduce yourself and talk with other guests, continue talking about what your first car was and those horror stories. <laughs> Remember, WFAE's ability to bring you these free festival sessions comes from listener support. Please donate any amount this Giving Tuesday to support the festival and the programming you love. You can give online at WFAE.org, via Venmo at WFAE Radio, and you can donate cryptocurrency by searching WFAE at The Giving Block. Now, I'm pleased to introduce the host for this session, WFAE reporter, Sarah D'Elia. Sarah is the lead host of, and reporter of WFAE's first ever investigative podcast, She Says, which follows the journey of a sexual assault survivor's struggle to find justice in Mecklenburg County. Sarah received a Gracie Award for her investigative work in She Says. She's also the host and reporter for The List, an award-winning podcast that explores the Catholic Church sex abuse crisis. Sarah, welcome. Take it from here. Thanks, Jen. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Kelly McEvers. Um, and if you're not familiar with Kelly, I'm sure a lot of you are. Uh, she is a two-time Peabody award-winning journalist and the former host of NPR's All Things Considered. She spent uh, a large chunk of her career as an international correspondent. And she is, of course, the creator and host of the acclaimed Embedded podcast, a documentary documentary show that goes to hard places and makes sense of the news and spends a lot of time there. So uh, Kelly, thank you so much for joining us. First of all, I'm really excited for this conversation. Thank you so much for having me. I am a huge WFA fan and I'm super happy to be here. Thank you. And thanks for everyone who is joining us right now. Um, like Jen said, this is an opportunity to learn, to ask questions. I'm really excited to learn something new today. Uh, I think it's great that we have folks in all different levels here. Maybe some of you have been podcasting for a while. Maybe some of you are brand new to it. So there is no question too big or too small uh, to tackle today. And um, just a quick side note, I first heard Kelly, um, I was familiar with her work, but she was at a uh, panel for Third Coast, and this was like 2013-ish, and I was really early on in my career, and that panel at, that Kelly spoke on, which was all about how to be resilient and how to figure out how to do hard reporting with very little, <laughs> really stuck with me and made an impression. Um, so I hope today's conversation is the same for you all, and that you take it throughout your careers and your lives and um, hopefully can apply some of the, the stuff that we talk about today. If you have any questions, uh, make sure to drop them in the Q&A and we'll try to kind of organically go through them um, as is appropriate. And then at the end, we'll save a little bit of time that's just for questions. So um, hosting a podcast <laughs> is a lot harder than it sounds, especially <laughs> if you make a good one, it should sound effortless, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that goes into to creating a good podcast. And in my opinion, it starts with an, a good idea, right? But it also starts with that host. I mean, if you think of how many podcasts or radio stories you've turned off because you did not connect or like that host, um, you know, I'm guilty of that as well. So I want to start Kelly there with just the basics, start out big and, and we'll work our way in, you know, what right. makes a good podcast host? What is, what's the magic sauce that a host needs to have to, to set the right tone for that podcast? Well, I want to just start by saying, um, maybe I don't know, like maybe I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to, trying to put myself out here as like the person with all of the answers or the magic sauce, but I've learned a few things along the way. And I also just kind of want to be clear about the kind of podcasts I make versus the kinds of podcasts that are, you know, most abundant out there. I mean, there's kind of two categories. I think most of, you know, right. There's the kind of that Sarah and I make, right. It's like reported documentary style produced podcast where you, you know, you could spend days, weeks, months really shaping a thing. You know, when we write it all out, we actually call it a script. 
um, you know, drafts get edited and edited and edited. And it takes, you know, it takes some time. And then there's just the talkie podcast, right? The ones where people sit in front of a microphone and talk. And this could be anywhere from crooked media to like, you know, um, basket weaving daily. And, and they're all, you know, there's something that, that connects with people and all of them. And, and that is, like you said, who's the person, right? Like who's the person. And, and I think it's really important to think about this, like you said, in sort of a basic way, you know, we don't have the visual, no one can see our face. They're literally putting these little earbuds like right next to their brain. You know, it's like the most intimate thing you could possibly imagine, right? It's right in there. It's in your head. You might be doing dishes or driving or riding your bike or whatever, but still it's right in there. And so all you have is the power of someone's voice, right? Like that's all there is. And so I think the key, honestly, and this is just something that I've been screaming from the rooftops about since I started, even in radio before podcasting, is that that person has to be themselves, right? Like they just have to be who they are. And some people are going to like you and some people aren't. Like some people, so instead of saying like, well, what's the magic thing that's going to make me connect with everyone? That's not the answer. The answer is the magic thing is to totally and completely be yourself and in hopes that some people will connect with that person, right? And then, but here's where it gets difficult. And Sarah, you and I were talking about this the other day. Um, you know, when I first started on the news magazine, I was hosting this big afternoon show, millions of people listened to it, national show, all things considered. And, you know, you sit down in front of that microphone and it was, it dawned on me. It was like, oh, nobody ever told me how hard it was going to be to sound like myself. And that may sound counterintuitive, but it's true. So this whole like, just be yourself, it's easy. It's not easy. It's actually a, a thing you have to work at a little bit. And there's some ways I, that I've come to learn to that, that have helped me get through that. Um, but a huge one is, and this is really hard, is you sort of have to forget about the trappings around you. Luckily with podcasting now, you could just be in your closet and it's just you and a mic and you're like talking to your sweaters. You know, then in the broadcast world, it's like this big studio, there's lights, there's clocks everywhere. There's this microphone in front of your face. There's an engineer, he's running this big board. You know, luckily with podcasts in this way, and I think this is why podcasts sound so good, is that all those kind of trappings have gone away and it's just you and the mic. And that's really important, I think, to think about. One of the ways to sound like yourself is just to think about it as this very intimate conversation between you and the mic. If you're not sitting at a table talking to three or four people like, you know, crooked media, um, um, you know, it's just you talking to the mic. And sometimes, you know, what I do to one of my favorite tricks is I think of like one of my best friends and I talk like I'm talking to my friend because that's who I am. You know, there's all these dumb rules in journalism and broadcast where like you can't say the same word twice. I don't know if you've come into come across this, but um, it's super weird. So like if you say like today there was a fire at blah, blah, uh, um, at the corner of first and third. And then in the second sentence, you're supposed to say the blaze ripped through the, you know, it's like, would you talk that way to your friends or would you just say fire again? And, and, and it sounds so silly, but it's actually really important. It's like, just try to remove all the trappings of formality and, and, and forget the way you think you're supposed to sound and talk the way you talk to your friends. And again, if you're doing a talkie podcast, that can be kind of easy because you're already just talking. But if you're doing like a written podcast, you sit down and you start to write and you start to write like this person who you're not. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to being yourself, I think that's one of the most important things. Oh, wow. Somebody says they will literally pull up a photo of a friend when they voice sometimes. Yeah, it's so great. I mean, I have this one friend who's in public radio, who's like really, really good at it. Like he's, he's fantastic. And so I'm always kind of trying to like, tell a story in, the, in a way that will impress him, you know, and make him like curious and interested. And so I always think of him when I'm like in the studio. So that's a great trick, but also just, what are the words that are coming out of your mouth? Are those words, words that you would say to your friends 
or are they words that you think someone's expecting you to say? That's probably my like number one rule. When I was at ATC, I kept a document in our like news archive of just all these like news words mm-hmm. that we didn't need to say. And people will say, well, you sound really informal. And it's like, yes, I know. <laughs> like, that's the deal. That's the plan. And it's, it, it's jarring at first because I think you're, people expect like, well, you're the broadcaster. You're supposed to be, you're not supposed to be God. I mean, that's the whole beauty of podcasts now, right? Is like, we're just the person that you want to hang out with. We're not, you know, the omniscient um, narrator. So yeah, yeah, that's my like number one thing is um, what makes a good host is somebody who is totally being themselves and not doing like this list of stuff that's like how to be authentic. It's like, no, just be yourself. Talk yeah. the way you talk to your friends. And I think having somebody in the studio with you, if you're lucky enough, or even like I've, you know, if I've had a hard time tracking something, trying to get the right tone, like having somebody, if they couldn't be there with me in person, having them on speakerphone, I've done that before. Yep. And, um, you know, I have uh, my colleague, Alex Olgan that I made, she says with, I was lucky enough to have her in the studio with me, but she was really good about like, you keep stumbling over that one line over and over again. It's because you don't talk that way. Yes. <laughs> and I was like, yes. but I feel like I should be talking that way. So having that other person, uh, I think is so important, whether you're visualizing them or you're lucky enough to have them in the studio for sure. Yeah, those um, of us who do produce podcasts, we're lucky enough to work with producers and editors who will hear stuff like that, right? If you're doing it on your own, right? It's, it's a little harder to like, listen to yourself like we have the luxury of people whose job it is to listen to us and tell us you're stumbling right you know is there another way you want to write that line because that's not how you talk to your friends so it's a harder thing to train yourself to do honestly this sounds crazy but another really good trick is do the tracks record them put it away wait till the next day and then put it in your earbuds and listen to it as Mm -hmm. if you're listening to another person's podcast and then you're like oh my god like I hear so much stuff like even in a read-through I'll do a live read-through and I'll be like this sounds great and then I record it and I'm like this is terrible like I have to change all this stuff because I try to it's almost like you're forcing yourself to listen to yourself as another person it's weird but it can work if you don't have the luxury of having like those people around you Yeah. Well, one person just um, wrote us a question that I think kind of goes into what we're talking about here. They said, if my show is available both on air and is also a podcast, how should I keep, should I keep it more conversational or less formal? So I guess, does the way you present yourself as a podcast host change, whether you're going to be featured on a segment in ATC versus, you know, making a longer version of that later, that's going into a, a podcast feed. I could answer this question for about a year and anyone who worked at me at ATC would, would testify that I never stopped talking about this (laughs) all the time. I think it should be the same. Like, I don't think there should be any difference at all because you should be yourself wherever you are. And, and this is a thing that I like fought with people constantly about, which is crazy. Again, never knew how hard it was going to be to sound like myself, but you should totally be the same. Because like, just think about all the times that you are in your car and you pull over and you're like, holy crap, that's a good piece of radio. It's when you're hearing people on tape who've been interviewed, who sound completely like they're being totally real and honest, right? Not some politician that being like, but like somebody who's telling, telling a story about something that happened to them. And also the person guiding you through that story is also someone who feels real and honest, right? Like those are the things that you remember. And the reason is, is because the person was being themselves. And so I would say absolutely without hesitation, it should be the same, but it's hard. (laughs) It's really, it's harder than, um, yeah, it's harder than I thought for sure. Yeah. We did, um, a series, uh, this year called still here that I hosted and we threw it in a podcast feed and made it a a little bit of a longer version, but we also featured it on all things considered in morning edition. And that was something that we talked a lot about was just how do we package this? How different does it need to be packaged? How different does it need to feel? And that's kind of the same conclusion I reached was, well, this is a really, um, intimate podcast where we talk about how we've all survived the last year. So I want you to sound, you know, this is me 
um, trying to be as much of a human instead of the, the voice of God that sometimes we think we hear on the radio as possible. So um, I, I definitely agree. Is there a point, Kelly, in your career, especially when you think about podcasting and embedded, where you got pushback um, and you had to kind of advocate for yourself as a podcast host uh, and say like, no, this is why I need to say it this way or the tone that it needs to be because this is me. Yeah, actually really early on we did. I mean, I have all kinds of thoughts about some of the very earliest episodes that we did, but um, we did in our very first season, we would just go to one place per episode, just like go to the place, figure out a thing in the news, right? And that was actually really interesting and I sort of miss it. <laughs> I wish we could do it again. But um, <laughs> um, so uh, we were really struck, of course, by the opioid crisis and by um, this headline we were seeing, but it was like one of those headlines that's like buried on page 17 of the newspaper, you know what I mean? Where you're just like, I wanna know more about that. And it was that there was an HIV outbreak. This is 2015, right? In a small town in Indiana, like HIV outbreak, like didn't we figure out how to not have that happen? And it was am among intravenous drug users um, and um, in a place where needle exchanges were against the law. Um, this was Mike Pence's Indiana, um, and that was a decision that was made at the state level, um, was later um, rescinded. Um, but at the time, you could be arrested for possession of a needle. Um, so the needles were criminalized. Um, but there was a lot going on, too. It was just this particular type of drug um, that you could, you know, they have these safety coatings on it, and you could remove the safety coating and abuse the drug. So, um, you know, as we reported that story, we learned things. And um, I think in a more traditional setting, you would just lead with what you learned. And instead, and the things that we learned, right, were that like addiction um, is, you know, it alters your brain chemistry, um, that, you know, the best treatments are medical assisted treatments, right, which are, um, you know, taboo in a lot of communities because they think it's just replacing one drug with another. And so we learned a lot of that stuff right in the moment. We actually learned a lot more about needle exchanges and how they work um, and how helpful they are from a public health perspective. And so instead of just making that the headline, we let those lessons that we learned ourselves unfold in the episode. Again, as a way, and this is another thing that I think goes to hosting, the idea of being a host is not that you're and this is an interesting distinction. It's not like, hey, everybody, look at me. I'm so cool. It's, hey, everybody, come along with me while I try to figure some stuff out. That's at least how I've always approached it as a reporter too, right? It's like, it's grab my hand. Let's go. I don't know what we're going to find. It's an adventure out there. And even this could just be in a conversation, in an interview, right? It doesn't have to be like in Syria. <laughs> but like, come along, let's just go and let's ask a question and then let's try to figure out the answer together. And there was some pushback for that, like at first, like why, first of all, it's like you're making it too personal, right? Which is one of those old journalism taboos. You know, you're not supposed to use the word I or me, which like I broke that rule a long time ago. And, and, and again, it, the idea is I don't, it's not that I'm making the story about me, it's that I'm trying to be a stand-in for the listener. I'm trying to help the listener see what I see. And so to do, yeah, I'm like a vessel. You know, it's like, come along. You may not like coming along with me. You may turn off the podcast. You may disagree with me when I make my conclusion that, wow, you guys, medical assisted treatment is really, um, it's really effective um, for people um, with um, addiction. And so you know, you may disagree with that, but at least you came on the journey and you did something. Instead of me just telling you, I showed you what that's about. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that's, I think, um, I do think uh, that was probably the bi big pushback. And I was trying to say to people, again, this was like 2015, 2016. I was trying to say to a lot of people who were pushing back, like, this is what, again, this is what makes podcasts so great right, is this idea that you can be on a journey, you can be on a discovery, um, you don't have to fit everything into four or five minutes of a news broadcast, right, you can sort of take people um, places and just let them see what happens along the way. Yeah, 
Absolutely. And just to break down real quick for people, uh, Kelly and I are getting into uh, journalism jargon a little bit. So ATC is all things considered, um, <laughs> M ME morning edition, uh, the two flagship programs of NPR that you probably listen to on your way to your uh, at home desk or if you're commuting. Um, and let's see, you know, when we talk about um, a broadcast story, we're talking about a story that's anywhere from like three and a half to maybe six minutes long, typically four to five minutes long on ATC or, or morning edition, all things considered morning edition. So um, if you have any questions about any of the terminology we're using, please put them in, in the Q&A. Um, and thanks for, it's easy to, to get uh, into the jargon and forget that it is a language that needs to be decoded. So. Um, <laughs> Is there, you know, someone is asking us about um, the length of time um, different podcasts are. And I think that kind of lends into another question I was about to ask you about uh, seasons of podcasts. Some podcasts like Embedded, they put out a season and maybe that's 10 episodes, 15 episodes, and then they're going to go on hiatus and they're going to take the time to hopefully take a break <laughs> and, then, and do more reporting and then have things in the can, have things prepared to roll out for a next season. And then there are other podcasts that um, I'll use, she says, as an example, we had a couple of episodes in the can, but because we were reporting on a story that was unfolding in real time, we had to report that in real time. So yeah. we couldn't have a fully formed season to roll out. Yeah. Um, someone specifically is asking, can you do a good podcast in 10 minutes? So my question to you, Kelly, is, is there a time limit? Do you prefer seasons to, to rolling out continuous podcast episodes? What, where do you land there? It's so interesting right now, right? Cause like the possibilities are endless. And so in a way it's like, we suffer from the luxury. Um, I think, uh, I think almost every pod produced podcast, actually almost any podcast that I listen to is too long. Um, you know, in the broadcast business, you have to just cut everything down to the, cause you've only got, I mean, that you're a slave to the clock, right? There's only so many minutes in an hour that you're going to run and that broadcast show and all things considered, they're going to give you three minutes and 53 seconds. And you got to make your story fit that no matter what it's going to kill you. You're going to cut stuff. You didn't want to cut, but you have no choice. And then podcasts come along. You're like, I can do whatever I want. And then people are doing like hour and a half long episodes. And it's like, I am bored. So I generally think everything's too long. Um, I think, yes, for sure. Things can be 10 minutes. I mean, one of my favorite things as a correspondent before I became a podcaster was the challenge of doing a whole saga in like four minutes. Like you can do it. It can be done. You can tell a story. You can paint a picture. It's all just about, you know, the writing and who's your source and all kinds of stuff. So um, I like things at all lengths. Anytime I make something myself, I generally try to cut it by at least a third to half before it actually sees the light of day. Something I think is good. I'm like, this is good. You know, and then by the end, I'm like, let's just, you just start slashing um, and it's, and you're better for it. Um, I love seasonal podcasts. I think they're great. Um, I, it's harder these days in the business of podcasting um, that seasonal podcasts are harder to justify economically. Mm -hmm. like, that's just true. You've got a business model, right? That's built on advertising sales. What is going to make you more money? The podcast that's on every day or the one that comes around once a year? It's kind of simple. So I love them. And I think I wish they would have, there was another business model and a way for them to thrive because I think they're really important, whether it's, you know, serial or um, some of the other really strong journalism, like the Atlantic, you know, that just did this, that phenomenal one uh, last year called, Flood, or this past year called Floodlines. I mean, they worked on that for like a year and it's amazing. I'll never forget that podcast. Like I learned so many things in that podcast. Um, and so I, I think they're amazing. I also think that, you know, really short um, daily informational um, podcasts are great. I also think you can tell a really good story in a really short amount of time, like I said. So I think everything is at, at all lengths is awesome. It's the, the challenge is figuring out what's appropriate. Like what you've got a story you want to tell. You've got a question you're curious about. You're, you've got a subject you want to explore 
what format do you do it in and at what length? And that's hard. It's hard to, it's hard to answer that question because I think all of us are like, I'm going to do a 14 part, you know, four hour per episode series on gardening because I'm really interested in it. And if I'm interested in it, people are going to want to listen, but maybe not. That's when you start crowdsourcing. Again, if you don't have the luxury of like a couple other colleagues, like we do, start asking your friends, would you listen to a podcast about blah, blah, blah? Like, see what they think. I mean, the great thing is that, you know, people are really literate in podcasts now. So to ask people what the, what they would listen to, ask your, and ask like a, an array of people. Don't just ask like people who all think the same, right? Like ask people, different age groups, different, different economic status, obviously different um, uh, race than you. Like, you know, try to think big and like what, um, you know, what would appeal? Yeah. There is one podcast that comes to mind. That's, uh, I think it came out like in 2018 or 2017. That was called the Pope's Long Con. And that came out of the um, Kentucky Investigative Center. And, oh, yeah. and it was, they were like 10, 15 minute episodes yep. and they were so good. They, yep. they were also jam packed with information. So I found myself um, going back and re-listening. I'd go for a walk, listen. And then I do that because I like to kind of, you know, I, I kind of think of podcasting sort of as a journalist, like I like to see the pattern people use oh, like for sure. Secret, and then you kind of like take it apart and put it back together and see how someone made their podcast. Yep. Um, so that, that's a great example. I think it's called the Pope's long con. I would highly recommend it. And, yep. um, yeah, 10, 15 minute, minute episodes as much. And, uh, there's, there's a lot there. I'm just kind of trying to keep our questions going along with my questions. So <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I wanted, there was a couple questions I saw yeah. that I wanted to, Go first of it. all, someone talked about, you know, sounding like yourself and not everyone sounds like the dominant voices in podcasting. It is a hugely important question. Um, I'm so glad that you brought it up. I'm not seeing it anymore just because there's so many great questions. Um, so I would say your name, but I don't have it here. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, yeah, Mary, what advice would you give to folks whose version of sounding like yourself might not match how a lot of other podcasters sound? What do you hope to see change in our industry when it comes to hosting and who gets to host? I want to see everything change, right? Like I want to see it not just be like a bunch of white guys. Like it's, um, everyone should be able to sound like themselves. There should absolutely not be any sort of dominant voice. Um, the fact that there is um, sucks. I, for one, the way I've been trying to address it on my show is just finding ways to elevate other voices. So I'm like working on a new season right now where I'm not the main voice, you know, like I'm just, I'm working with other reporters, um, people who've never been in broadcast before, people of color, um, and we're doing it about policing. So it's like, I'm not going to just be the only reporter on that as a white person. I'm just not. And so um, trying to find ways to use the position that I have to elevate other voices. I mean, that's something that I can do. And also just, you know, thinking really hard about recruiting and hiring people who don't have access to this world. Um, it's a huge priority for me and my show. It's a huge priority for uh, my colleagues in programming at NPR. I, that's what I'm doing to change the industry. But like, yeah, just, I mean, in addition to that, I think we should all be screaming from the rooftops that um, there should be more voices. Um, in this world. And then somebody relatedly asked a question about, you know, uh, you have three, three minutes and 53, sorry, three minutes and 53 seconds to get a story in, but Joe Rogan gets three hours. Um, my answer to that is just don't listen to Joe Rogan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do we have to, I, you know, I mean, maybe, look, but here's the thing. There are people, obviously, lots of them who want to listen to Joe Rogan for three hours. So let them, you know, if that's what his marketplace is, obviously it was worth some money to Spotify. Um, that's what, you know, some people want, you know, mm -hmm. I like, I love the idea of a 10 minute investigative se uh, series. I and mean, that's amazing. I can't mm -hmm. wait. I know all about that series and I listened to some of it. I need to go back and listen. I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's the, you know, his listeners want that. I was listening the other day in an Uber. I was like, this guy had it on. I was like, is this, because it was a really long Uber ride. It's like an hour. I was like, is this really still on? Like, what are they, what do you have to talk about for three hours? I don't know. But, you know, some people like it. 
Yeah. Um, and I should say that we're getting a lot of uh, questions just about some technical things with podcasting. And those are all really great questions. I do want to make sure people see that tonight at six o'clock, there is a panel that's going to discuss just that. So I would encourage you if you're able to either join that live or go back and listen to the recording of that, because we are recording all of these. So um, one question I, I definitely wanted to make sure we got to was about inserting yourself as a host. Um, you, you brought up cereal before, and I feel like cereal is kind of like one of the the originals of, of podcasting, especially of criminal investigative podcasting. And if you haven't listened to it, I'd highly recommend it, um, especially the first season. And, you know, I think there were moments where Sarah Koenig, the, the interviewer, she, she kind of becomes part of the story. And I don't know if she knew she was going to become part of the story when she set it, set out to do that. And that was something that was surprising to me, when, especially when we made, she says of how much my reaction and how much of just my own discovery of certain things through our investigation would be key parts of the story. So Kelly, where do you strike that balance as far as inserting yourself? Um, you obviously don't want to make that an unnatural insertion. So where do you fall in that? Yeah. And I got at this in the previous answer, but I'll t I, again, this is another thing that I could talk about until I'm like blue in the face. Um, and I thought about this even before I got into podcasting again, it was like back in the day, back in the day, um, when I first started as like a correspondent in the middle East for, um, NPR, it was like this cardinal rule. Like you never, ever say I, or me, you never even appear on tape. Like you're not allowed. The rule was like, you weren't allowed to even, people weren't allowed to hear your question. Like if you were like, Hey, sir, where are you going with that gun? you know, this is like me in like, you know, Iraq and or whatever. And, but you like the back in the day, you weren't even allowed to have that question on the tape. And you're supposed to say something like when a reporter asked him, this is like totally New York Times style writing newspaper crap. When a reporter asked him where he was going with that gun, he said, I'm going to overthrow the government. And it's just like, are you kidding me? Like that is garbage. Like, and so I just like, of course you're going to put the question on tape because because it's better tape you know when you're like hey sir where are you going and there's a guy running and you're like you can hear the tension in the voice and you can hear the footsteps and like it's all there it's like a scene from a movie right why would you not use that is the way i felt as a mm. reporter right it's like why would you because it, why again it doesn't showcase me it's not putting the spotlight on me like listen to my amazing question that I've thought out for years and planned with a, a host of staff. No, I'm just in the, I'm a human being in the moment going, holy crap, dude, where are you going with the gun? I just made this up by the way. But, um, and that to me, that's theater, right? That's good stuff. Like that's, and again, I'm not, I don't want you to think about me in that moment, but I want you to be standing there asking the same question. I want you, the listener, to be like, where is that guy going with the gun? He's going to overthrow a government? That sounds crazy. Like, you know what I mean? I want to bring you into that moment. I am the stand-in for you. Um, but it's a really subjective thing. Like when you're like, am I a stand-in or I put, am I putting the spotlight on myself? And that's the struggle, I think, all the time. Like I hear hosts say stuff when they're asking people questions like, when I was in Iraq, I found that blah de blah and so-and-so told me. And it's like, you're kind of putting the spotlight on yourself. You're trying to kind of make the story. You're trying to show to everyone, like I know things because I was there before. Uh, to me, I, it's, maybe it's just a matter of taste. That's not the kind of inserting yourself into the story that I think is good. Yeah. The kind of inserting yourself into the story that I think is good is when you're trying to just be a stand-in for the listener. I, there were, I got to a point as a reporter in the Middle East, and this again, before podcasting, and it's kind of why I became a podcaster, um, where I, I would literally leave my reactions on tape. Like somebody would be like, hey, come in here and see this. And it's like a warehouse full of guns and rebels. And you're like, <gasps> I'd be like, oh, wow. And like, it's so silly. It sounds really silly, but just again, so the listener can feel like this is shocking. You know what I mean? Instead of me saying, this was shocking. Just hear me go, <gasps> you know, on the tape because it's shocking, right? Like, it's like, oh no, this is bad. <laughs> like there's a whole bunch of guys 
waiting in this warehouse, ready to go fight. Like, yikes. Yeah. Um, you know, bad things are coming. Whatever. It's like one little gasp. I mean, it sounds super corny, but like, gets, again, brings, I hope, brings the listener in. My other favorite thing I would do, and I, you probably heard me talking about this at that talk a long time ago at Third Coast, I used to count all the time because on the on air, like I would be like, oh, here come the tanks. One, two, three, four. Like I would do it in real time. And again, not to put the spotlight on me, but just so you, it also gives like some rhythm to the story. It like lets the listener take, take it in, like gives you like those four seconds. Instead of being like, Instead of saying four tanks rolled by, again, tell versus show. I would show the four tanks rolling by in audio just by narrating it, just for those few moments. Again, so you could sit there and think, holy crap, what's it like to have the tanks roll into your neighborhood? It just gives you like one, four seconds to think about that, right? And so those are the kinds of moments that I did as a reporter that made me think about a lot. Like, I think I thought a lot about it because I was breaking the rules. I wasn't supposed to do any of it, but I just did it anyway. And my editor eventually let me get away with it. Um, God bless him. Um, <laughs> I asked him years later, I was like, why did you let me do that? He's like, I don't know. I just thought it was what the kids were doing. <laughs> um, he was like, this is like classic uh, editor at NPR. But, um, but so by doing it that way, and it made me think all the time about what is a host and when are you supposed to insert yourself? And that's my answer. It's like, and, but again, it's a fuzzy answer. It's like when you're not when you're the story, but when you're the stand in for the listener. Yeah. Yeah. And I do remember that counting tip and it is something that I do in my reporting. It's something nice. I did. <laughs> it's something I did a lot, especially covering uh, civil unrest and protests and uh, different thing demonstrations that we've had in Charlotte when I'm trying to see how many police there are versus protesters. Um, it also is just like a nice thing for your brain. So you don't have to, it's hard to write and hold a recorder at the same time. So it's really nice to have those visual notes to go back and, and, yeah. um, sometimes they make really good sound for your podcast or for your, your tape in your, your program too. Yep. Sometimes you're just taking notes into yeah. your microphone and then you realize like, Oh, that's kind of good tape, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, you're just, you're narrating to your, your future self, like, oh, I got to remember this because, okay, there's four, those four cop cars came in over here and then they started throwing the tear gas from that. They're, they're throwing the tear gas right now from the corner of first and, 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 you know, third. And, you know, you're saying all that in a way as like a way to remember it later, but then you like go back and listen and you're like, that's good tape, you know, yeah. brings person into that moment. What's it like to be in your own city? Your own town, where you usually like are walking to the corner to get coffee, and now all of a sudden it's like a militarized zone. What's that like? Giving people a couple seconds to think about what that's like. Yeah, I want to talk about being. I think some of the questions that we're getting kind of lend itself to this bigger picture question of just sort of when you're juggling an intense interview or just a one-on-one -on -one interview where you're going to be spending a lot of time with this person and you need to be truly present with them. How do, how do you maintain that to make sure that you're, you're um, listening for good follow-up questions and that, you know, when you go back and listen to that tape, you're not saying like, oh, dang, I wish I should, I should have, this was the obvious question I forgot to, to ask. So yeah. how do you stay present? I don't know. You know, <laughs> I mean, it just, to me, people, it's, this is kind of a corollary to like, people are like, how do you get people to talk to you? And it's like, I don't, there's no method, right? It's like, everybody wants to talk. The thing is that you have to actually listen. Like you have to actually listen the whole time to what people are saying. Um, and I don't know that I have a technique beyond that, right? Like I'm a, just an incredibly curious person. I think you are too. I think a lot of us who are here wanting to do this are curious, right? Because the whole idea of making a show about something and asking people to follow you along is to have a curiosity that you want people to follow, whether it's interviews about, um, you know, street paving or, um, you know, your long investigation of, of, of an injustice, right, in your community. Um, so just really, really, really listen. I think sometimes people get distracted by the techniques you know, like trying to write out, I know it's a huge debate with me and my people and 
it's a big This American Life thing is you write the questions out beforehand and like you work on the questions as a group and you make a question list and it's like a whole thing. Um, I don't love it. I'm actually more of a just be complete. I mean, there's some, there's like things in your head, you know, you want to make sure you don't forget and I'll write those down in a notebook, but I'm just like listening intently to the person the whole time, because I think honestly, it's the highest form of respect and, um, people, every single but every single person, even the politician who doesn't want to talk to you, he wants to talk to you. He wants to, you know, and it's just a question of, you know, how, like when I interviewed Mitch McConnell, it's not like he's going to be like, you know what, I've finally decided to tell everyone my deepest, darkest secrets. Like that's not going to happen, you know, but I'm still going to listen to him all the whole time. I'm going to look him right in the eye, the whole, for, you know, those two interviews I had with him. Um, long sit down interviews the whole time i'm gonna laugh at his jokes and i'm gonna just listen to him like he's a human being um and hope for the best <laughs> yeah i i personally i do like writing out my questions because i find as i'm writing my questions it makes me think of other questions i wouldn't have thought of but i bring that piece of paper my notepad to the interview and i flip it down and i just listen and i do the conversation and at the end I like to just check and make sure because is sometimes there anything it, I've forgotten. Yeah, exactly. And always ask at the end, is, is there, there anything, anything I should have asked forgot. you? Yeah, exactly. Right. Is there yeah. anything I should have asked you? Yeah. Anything you want else you want to, anything you should, I should, should have asked you. I always say that anything I should have asked you that I didn't. Yeah. And they're like, oh yeah, you should. And it's like half the time. It's great. But yeah. yeah. I really have, I don't know because I have a hard time thinking about interviews in terms of techniques, because I feel like, and I think everybody has their own style on this. I have zero judgments of people who have a different style. I just have my style and my style is one that is devoid of as many techniques as possible and trying to just be listening. Um, Cause it just, I'm just like, a, I'm not that smart. Like it takes all my energy to focus on one person. You know what I mean? Like I can't do a bunch of stuff at this. I mean, part of it is just that, you know, it's like, I can't, I can't have like questions over here and then like somebody listening in and blah, blah, blah. It's too much. Yeah. Someone asked if, um, does this break the flow of the, inter I think that's in response to me saying I flipped Oh, the questions. Yeah yeah. 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 So I, I do that at the very end. Like when I, you know, when I'm prepared for not to be able to ask any other question, I say, hold on just, just a minute. And hopefully by then we have a good rapport and, um, I take a quick look. Um, and then I ask, you know, is there anything else? And to me, since it's the end and I already have to ask people to sit in silence with me for a couple of minutes to get that background sound. Like that's more of the awkward point, um, which sometimes I do at the beginning of the interview. Um, so getting room tone is really important. We call it ambient radio. Um, and you either need to do that at the beginning of the interview. So you have that background noise that, so you can nicely weave in your sound. Um, you can either do that at the beginning or the end. I like to do it at the end because I think it is kind of awkward. And if I have a person I already feel a little awkward talking to let's save the awkward part for the end. Um, so that that's just how I handle it, but you can also, there's no like black and white way to approach it. And everyone is different and everyone you're going to interview is different. And, you know, you just have to, re I think you have to read the room, um, yeah. and, and just proceed <laughs> with whatever way makes the most sense. Um, this is a great question that we have, you know, we're talking about what makes a good podcast host. Um, what are things that a good host should avoid in your opinion? Oh, I mean, again, like making themselves part of, like making themselves too much of like, oh man, there's so many different kinds of podcasts, right? But um, I think like making it, just being too self-aggrandizing, right? Like too self-promotional. It's just going to come across as like inauthentic. Like if you're just too... The great thing about me is like, no one's going to do that, but like constantly be checking yourself on that one. You know what I mean? Like, don't, um, yeah. Like, is this, why is the spotlight on you right now? Like, why are you talking? Like what, sir, what purpose are you serving at any given moment? Like, and, and you always have the listener in mind. Like, what am I doing for the listener right now? Like, how is what I'm doing 
is it explaining something without being mansplainy or white splainy? Is it, um, you know, am I helping someone? If I am I taking someone? I mean, my thing is, am I taking someone along for the ride? I hope so. You know, if I am I just telling something about myself for the sake of doing it? Like, is it really illuminating the story? Right to be like, my car burned up when I was sixteen. Did you really need to know that? I don't know. I was just trying to break the ice and like get people talking, right? But like, you know, that was the purpose that that was serving. Like who really cares? So just always kind of check yourself, I think is good. Like that's, that's a big thing too. And then again, just like, don't try, you know, if you're trying to sound like somebody else, like that's a bad host, like somebody who's trying, you can hear it too. You can totally hear it. Like you can hear people who are trying to sound like other people. Um, you're just like, ah, just be you. I have really good friends in the business who, sorry, my phone is ringing. That should stop doing that. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. Hold, please. Um, I have friends in the business who uh, are so good at their jobs, but I still wish that they would just be themselves, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's funny, there's certain types of interviews where they will sound like themselves and then certain types of interviews where they won't. And you're like, and that's, that's where you, so you, it's like, I know you're there, you know, be you. And I think sometimes what happens is it depends on who you're interviewing. And we haven't talked as much about interviewing, but you sort of, I mean, because you want to be adaptable and you want to be a great listener, you maybe start to sound different in certain ways, um, just to match the tone or the stature of your interviewee, but don't do that. Like, just be you. Like, you know what I mean? Like, even when I'm talking to Mitch McConnell, I'll be like, man, no way. Tell me more about that. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't have to be formal just because he's at the time was, you know, the Senate majority leader or whatever, mm -hmm. when we did a whole series about him for our podcast. Um, you know, I mean, maybe I was a little more formal because I was like in person, I was in his office. I had like nicer clothes on than I would normally have. Fine. But, you know, like, and you're respectful, of course, like, but, you know, I'm still, when you're asking the questions, you still want to sound, and I, you know what, thinking back, I probably did a pretty terrible job of sounding like myself in that interview, because I had written the questions out beforehand, because I was super nervous that I was going to forget, or that I wasn't, gonna, you know, we had, like, very specific things we wanted to ask him, because this is obviously someone who is a professional interviewee, you know, so, yeah, um, check yourself, like check yourself all the time mm -hmm. and make sure you're sounding like yourself. I think is the biggest thing. Well, let's talk about interviewing. We have um, a little over 10 minutes left and inter you know, being a good interviewer is part of being a good host. Um, I think of someone like Anna Sale from the podcast, Death, Sex and Money. I love that podcast. And part of the reason I love it is because Anna, I think does such a, a good sincere job of interviewing people. That's a podcast from WNYC. Um, if you want to look that up That's and great. they talk about hard things to talk about death, sex, and money. So, um, how do you approach, how do you get people to open up to you? How do you get Mitch, someone like Mitch McConnell to, to feel comfortable and, and talk to you? Again, he's a professional. I don't know that he sees me much different than anyone else who interviews him, which is fine. You know, he kind of, we're all in the same, I mean, he, to me, he's in like politician box and to him, I'm in like interviewer journalist box. So it's hard to like break out of those boxes. But again, with everyone, listen, 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 and like legitimately listen. And I think, and, but like the whole time, like I was saying before, like completely and utterly focus on nothing but them. And that's hard. It's hard to put your own ego in a box because what are you thinking, right? You're like, oh my God, am I doing a good job? Am I asking the right question? Do I look stupid? Am I, uh, do, am I being too awkward? Do I have the right clothes on? Um, is, does my breath stink? Like to, to not think about all that stuff is hard. So that's key. Just like, just put your ego in a box and literally only think about them. Um, and also I think sometimes naturally, right? Naturally, um, when you have a personal reaction to something someone is saying, again, like you would with a friend, Imagine it as you're sitting up at two in the morning with a friend doing whatever you might be doing at two in the morning. Um, <laughs> but like, and so sometimes I'll just say like, wow, you know, that happened to me too once. This one time I was with this person and they said this and the, you know, like, don't be afraid. Mm. To, you know, your ego's in a box, but don't be afraid to just kind of react, right? And be a human. Yeah. Don't think that you're supposed to be you know, even like with Mitch McConnell, I'm like, wow, that's really funny. I never thought of it that way. 
you know, or like, oh, I never heard that story. Tell me more about that. Like, that's just the normal thing that I would say to a friend. Like, don't be worried about like, am I saying the right thing? Is it on my question list? Da, da, da. It's like, and the more I think, and this is a Mark Maron thing, right? Like this is what makes Mark Maron so good is he shares his personal experiences with other people and that makes them open up. As the mother of a 12 year old, I think about this all the time too. Instead of like trying to woman's explain to her, like what you should be doing is burp, burp, burp. I'm like, you know, when I was 12, that happened to me too. And it's really kind of magical um, in that she'll open up because she appreciates that like I failed at something <laughs> when I was her age. And so I think you just being human and being vulnerable with people is, um, don't block yourself from doing that. So check your ego and all the worries and the concerns and like yeah. anything like that, but like, let yourself be vulnerable. I'm so glad you brought up Mark Marin. I love Mark Marin so much. It's like, yeah. it's so yeah. nice. It, and it feels like he, one of the, I think he's a great interviewer, but I also just love how I feel like he's talking to me as I'm doing whatever I'm doing. And that is what makes him such a great host. I also think just to piggyback off of what you said, you know, if I know if I'm interviewing somebody and it's going to be a really heavy interview and they, it might take them a while to open up to me. I, you know, since I am a reporter, I am my own producer. I am my own booker. <laughs> so I try not to book anything after that interview. I try to give myself as much time with that person. Um, if I have the luxury of it that day, that doesn't always happen, but sure. um, I try to look at my schedule and see how much time I'm really going to need for that person. Um, knowing that it, it, you know, if I'm asking them to relive a trauma or to talk about, you know, something really horrible that happened to them, um, that's, that's going to take time. And I think if you can give yourself that time with someone, um, they're going to appreciate it and you're going to appreciate it too. You're going to get a better story and a better interview. We would do, even for all things considered, right? It's a daily news show, like the longest interview we're going to air. And this is super rare, right? It was like eight minutes or, I mean, in the rare occasion would be 11 minutes. But if we knew it was like a really important thing, we'd book it for an hour because we're like, we again, like, because, you know, we want to make it clear, like we've got the time for you, you know? Got, yeah, like you just said, it's a really good point you know, um, and, or somebody's like, do you have to go? I'm like, nope, I'm here as long as you want to talk. Cause that's true. Like I really am like, I'll just, I mean, most of our interviews for the podcast, this is for a produced reported podcast are, I mean, we book three hours, you know, I mean, that's just, we have the luxury of doing that. We don't have a daily news deadline to adhere to, but um, and sometimes it's shorter. That's fine. Somebody, sometimes people are like, yeah, I kind of don't have anything else to say. And you're like, okay, great. But sometimes people, because you're listening, right. And you're focused on them. You're really listening. Just have a lot to say. And please, there's a lot of ground to cover. Yeah. Um, so yeah. These really two fun. questions are, are kind of cousins to each other. So I'm going to group them. Um, you know, one question is asking, um, how do you get guests to be succinct, succinct with their answers? Um, sometimes people can be really long winded. Um, and if you're working at a smaller shop or you're working on a podcast or a produced piece or, um, interview, you don't have the luxury of a producer to help you. So how do you get them to be succinct? And the, uh, the next person asked, how do you politely stop someone from giving a stump speech during an interview? And I think those could kind of go hand in hand. So I'll leave that with you. Yeah. Um, stump speech for sure. Like, I, again, like it's, that's, that's the, where you're checking yourself, like, right. Like the spotlight's not on you, like you. Um, and again, I think this is a style question though. Like it's really important. Um, you know, I've seen, I've worked with other journalists. I worked with this New York times journalist years ago in Russia. We just happened to be working together. And I, he kind of yelled at people. He's like, no, you don't got to answer the question. You know, blah, 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 blah. and like, blah, 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 blah. you know, it was like hardcore journalism. And I was just like, huh, I never thought of doing it that way. Like I've never yelled at anyone. And it was great. Like it got results. He was a dude. The person he was interviewing was a dude. It was like dude energy, you know, maybe that's your style. So again, I think like all the things I'm saying are what work really well for me. And I want to emphasize that. And I think um, that you know, I might feel safe in situations that other people to do what I do in situations that other people might not feel safe into. I want to acknowledge that. Um, 
so I think it's, you know, how are you, how can you be yourself, be vulnerable, but also feel safe and, you know, um, just know that you're kind of being true to like how you would ask questions of a friend, you know? And again, again, not everyone has that luxury all the time. So, you know, I just want to acknowledge that too. Sorry. What was the first question? I forgot. Yeah, the other question was about, you know, if you have, how do you get um, a guest that you, if you're on a tighter deadline and you have oh. a guest that's going to, you know, is long winded, how oh, is yeah. there a polite way to kind of d- oh, head off. that off? Yeah. Just be honest, man. I mean, that's the thing is just be like as honest and transparent as you can. Just be like, I don't have any more time. I'm really sorry. You are amazingly interesting. And what I'll usually do is like, maybe 10 minutes before I'm like, there's like two things I have to cover with you before you go. So like, can we just, I'm so sorry. We've got 10 minutes left. I got two things, you know, just tell them, be transparent. Just like say all the, like, that's the truth. Or just be like, my editor's breathing down my neck. I got nothing. I got, I'm in deep trouble. Like I'm not, I can't do this anymore. Whatever. Just, just say the truth. Like the, the truth is the best part. Like, don't, there's no technique, right? Just say what's true. And just like, okay, I got, I got it. We got to get through this stuff. Like the most important part of the story, as I told you at the beginning, when I asked you for this interview was that we were going to discuss the reason why, you know, your committee did not open an investigation. So I need you to just point blank answer that question. You know, just say, I need you to do this. The thing about it is, is we're professionals too, though. Like this is our job. You know, there's nothing wrong with saying like, Hey, my job is to do this and your job is to do this. You're in this interview. You've agreed. I mean, this is a little more journalism, but it's true of, of like entertainers too. We've agreed to be in this space together. And so a lot of times just setting the parameters ahead of time, mm. setting the time parameters, setting the parameters of what you want to do. I mean, a lot of times people are like, well, what do you want to talk about? I mean, usually when you ask someone for an interview, they're like, well, what do you want to talk about? So you just set the parameters. I, I'm really interested. I'm super curious about, I'm interested in, I have so many questions about, you know, but then when you really get down to it, it's like, all right, you know, look, we said we we're going to talk about this. We got 10 minutes left. Let's make sure we cover it. I want to make sure I cover all the bases. I want to make sure I cover it because I want to give you a fair shake, you know, too. That's the other thing. It's like, you deserve that people deserve to hear the whole 360 right now of your life story or of you know why you were corrupt for 25 years and then you decided to change you know whatever it is like people deserve to hear all of that and you deserve to have your say so let's cover it but then I gotta go yeah (laughs) and Judon says two minutes left (laughs) yeah (laughs) well I just wanted to to make the point you brought up like um the editor kind of breathing down your neck too. And I, I mean, I have thrown, I mean, and he knows it, I've thrown my editor under the bus so many times when some, oh, yeah. you know, oh, I'm yeah. sorry, he's really, you know, like I really have to. Um, so I would totally, even if it's an imaginary editor, um, <laughs> would use that excuse to, to kind of push for someone. And um, the, you know, you basically answered this question, but just in case there was anything left unanswered, um, this will be the last question we take, you know, about prepping guests. Um, personally, I mean, we never hand out questions beforehand to someone. I mean, that's journalism 101. You don't hand out your questions, but I am always happy to have a conversation with someone because I want them to be comfortable. And also being on the other side of the mic, having done interview media interviews for the work I've done, that's a very humbling experience. And I always appreciate that reporter, you know, taking the time to talk to me before I go on the record with them. Do you have any, any tips for prepping guests? Yeah. Um, and I just want to respond really quick to one in the chat. One person said, that's interesting, but you didn't answer the question. So let's try again. Said almost no journalist ever. I say that all the time, all the time. I say it maybe more politely. I'll be like, that is so interesting, but I really want to try this again. Okay. Let's, This question, I just really want to get at it. Like, there's a polite way of saying that, right? When people don't answer the question. I mean, if you're doing like a hard nose, hard talk type interview with a politician, sometimes you just say, you didn't answer the question. Please answer the question. Like, if you want to be like super rude about it, whatever. But I say that all the time, Gary. So um, in just different ways. Um, Prepping, again, transparency, honesty, all of it. What are you, but don't put it in like, I'm going to need you to answer. I'm going to need you to do this. I'm curious about, I have questions about, listeners are dying to know, like people would love to hear a story about, right? It's like, be super transparent about like what your, the burning question is in your mind. Like, why did you call this person? Why do you want to interview them? Um, What is it that you cannot live? What is the answer that you cannot live without? Tell them, 
you know, like I am dying to know how you met Cheryl. Like, how did you guys find each other? This is crazy, you know, or, you know, if it's like that kind of story, but it's also just like, I really want to hear how you got into this, this line of work. I would love to hear about your artistic process. Like, how did you go from zero to that song? You know, or like, I can't imagine that you've made this many paintings in the last 20 years. How did you do it? I cannot wait to ask you that question. Like, that's it. Prep them with transparency. What is it that's you're dying to tell them? And also, but like the reason for the interview, I'm doing a podcast about basket weaving and you are the preeminent basket weaver. Our listeners are going to be so honored to finally hear from you after you've been in hiding for these 25 years, JD Salinger of basket weaving, whatever, you know what I mean? Like, I just think like, be super transparent, you know, like, what is it that you are dying to know and tell them that that's what you and the listeners um, want to know. Great. Thank you so much, Kelly. And uh, we do want to remind folks that we have a lot of great, this is only day one. Uh, this is only the kickoff. So there's a lot of great panels that are forthcoming. Um, again, that that one tonight at six o'clock. If you have your, your technical questions, um, sorry if we couldn't get to those, but bring those questions tonight at six o'clock. Uh, check out the panels. Um, there's a lot of great, there's marketing, there's how to monetize your podcast. There's there's a wealth of information. And um, if you miss a podcast or if you, if you miss a panel, remember that we're recording all of them, you can go back and listen. So thank you guys so much for your thoughtful questions. Thanks for for being so engaged in this. And Kelly, thank you so much to you. Thank you, Sarah, for all your amazing questions and your insights too. I feel like I learned some stuff also Thanks. and I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks. Bye everybody.